Hello, and thank you for joining today's special webinar by the National Organization for Rare Disorders, Critical Path Institute, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The topic of today's webinar is the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data and Analytics Platform, which today's presenters may refer to as RDCA DAP or the Cures Accelerator Platform. My name is Alexa Moore, NORD's Vice President of Development, and I'll be your facilitator for today's webinar. I'll provide a brief overview of the agenda, some brief introductions, and I'll turn things over to our speakers. If you'd like to listen by phone, you'll see a listen by phone button on your screen. Simply click that and follow the directions. As a reminder, the call is being recorded, and the recording will be made available to the rare disease community via NORD's website, the e-newsletter, and through social media channels. On this slide, you'll see the agenda for today's webinar. After this brief introduction, you'll hear from our panel of four speakers representing NORD, FDA, CPAS, and Takeda Pharmaceuticals. We'll finish the presentation with a question and answer session for the time that we do have remaining. Regarding Q&A, we have collected many of your questions when you registered to attend the webinar, and you will also have the ability to submit questions through, throughout the webinar. If you're watching the slides now and using the Global Meet browser, there's a chat function for typing in questions. To use it, simply look for the Ask a Question box on the left-hand side of your window, and you can type in a question at any time during the presentation. But please note that we'll address the questions at the end after our presenters are finished, because some of the questions that you may answer um, will be answered by the presenters during the course of the presentation. These are today's speakers in order. First, we'll hear from Pam Gavin, NORD's Chief Strategy Officer. Pam Gavin sets the strategic direction for NORD and implements programs and services that provide innovative solutions to address the needs of the rare disease community. And next, we'll hear from Michelle Campbell, Senior Clinical Analyst, who leads stakeholder engagement from the Office of Neuroscience at FDA. Dr. Campbell's focus is on patient-focused drug development and the use of patient experience data in the regulatory setting. Next, we'll hear from Jane Larkendale, Executive Director, Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data Analytics Platform at CPAS. Jane also runs the Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium, Friedrich Ataxia Integrated Clinical Database, and the new Sickle Cell Disease Consortium at the Critical Path Institute. Last, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Alexander, Vice President and Head Global Clinical Science in the Neuroscience Therapeutic Area Unit at the Takeda Pharmaceuticals International. Bob's an expert in psychopharmacology and has conducted clinical studies in a broad range of neurologic and psychiatric targets, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Now we'll start today's presentation, um, and then first we'll welcome Pam Gavin. Um, Pam, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Alexa. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you and my fellow presenters in a discussion on a topic core to NORD's mission and its actual founding, our commitment to accelerating the development of treatments and cures for rare conditions. In some ways, our community has been here before. Over 35 years ago, the federal government responded to our dire need to help change the trajectory for people living with rare conditions by passing landmark legislation that put into place financial incentives to conduct research and develop treatments for rare orphaned conditions. Several experts claim that the ODA has been one of the most successful pieces of healthcare legislation passed in the U.S., and the number of FDA-approved orphan indications support that notion. Last year, almost 44% of the drugs approved within CEDAR were orphan products. It really speaks to FDA's flexibility while maintaining its standards of efficiency and safety. It also speaks to the value of the Orphan Drug Act incentives and the trailblazing collaborations that have taken place amongst all the stakeholders in the community, including industry, researchers, patients, patient groups, and our regulatory officials. However, despite this impressive success, there remains much more to do. In these 35 plus years, the scientific community has con continued to evolve as well. Just in the last 10 years, we went from having about 58 
1,200 known rare diseases to over 7,000 today. And many of these diseases are not even uh, being studied yet. There's a lot we need to bring together to increase our understanding of them. A lack of knowledge about disease progression and patient experiences is a central issue that is exacerbated by the fact that we are dealing with small patient populations spread over a diverse geographic area. There are other challenges reflected in the rare community noted on this slide that many of you grapple with daily. In some ways, it's an opportunity to go back to our roots, think outside of the box, and embrace new ways to continue to close that gap and approve therapies for rare conditions. To that end, NORD is very pleased to support FDA's Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Program and to partner with CPATH to develop the RDCA DAP. Among other core competencies, CPATH has broad experience in building data consortiums um, and advanced analytics for regulatory use and the development of drug development tools. The RDCA DAP, Rare Disease Cures Accelerator, data and analytics platform, provides for a neutral environment to integrate disparate data, de-identified data, made available for analysis and support of accelerating drug development. There are many features and benefits to the RDCA DAP, such as accelerating the understanding of rare conditions, better informed study designs, increased opportunities for cross-disease discovery, just to name a few that my colleagues from FDA and CPATH will cover in this presentation, in their presentations, rather. So with that, I will pass over the presentation to Michelle Campbell, who will share with you some of FDA's perspective on this very important initiative. Michelle? Thank you, Pam, and thank you for that great um, introduction to RDCA DAP and our progression over time from the passage of the Orphan Drug Act to where we are now and how really we see the Rare Disease Cures uh, program going the next step and continuing the growth um, and accelerating uh, our treatment options for our rare diseases. So why is a Rare Disease Cure Accelerator important? And why now? And so I'm sure to those of you on the phone, the slide in front of you is something of your every day. When we work with our rare disease patient population, along with our investigators and sponsors, we're all faced with the same challenges. We have vast knowledge gaps about natural history, disease progression. We're often dealing with small, disparate patient populations. We know that being able to conduct a randomized clinical trial um, it can be difficult and add challenges with, due to this lack of information. And we know that we need a better solution. As Pam mentioned in a, one of her slides, and as you see on the screen here, the challenges in rare disease drug development is familiar to all of us. But these are just some that we consider or we think about ourselves when we consider what are those challenges. For example, what do we know about the rare disease? How do we define it? How do we diagnose the disease? Do we know what causes the disease? Is it a gene mutation? Is it something else? What is the natural history? What is the course of the disease? How does it progress? Is it a rapid progressing disease? Is it slowly progressed over time? So these are often things that we have a lot of unknowns when we're looking into our rare disease drug development. Understanding the patient perspective is important, and often we need to understand what are the impacts that matter most, what is current uh, available treatments that may be uh, being used to treat our patient population, what is the likelihood of being able to um, it, to administer something that will treat those most important impacts. So we need understanding those things before we even get into a development program is often, again, can be some of those gaps that we have. So we'll, if we are able to even think about a clinical trial, we have to think about the considerations that we see in this third column here. And they can include is the preclinical work 
Is the drug even safe to be tested in humans? How, what is the study design? Does it make sense? What is the study protocol? How are we going to um, enroll our patient population if, if we are looking at global drug development? How are we going to collect this data? And these are just some challenges, and there's many more that we all are aware of when we're trying to look at where to use drug development and put together a study protocol. Congress appropriated to the FDA in the last fiscal year of 2019 funding specifically for an investment in innovation in rare disease. <clears throat> and this funding has come to CEDAR, and we are investing it, um, investing the funds in innovation into launching this work of what we're calling the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator. So let me take a moment to step back from RGCA DAP and explain to you what RGCA is, or the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator. We hope that the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator will adopt a cooperative research approach that can accelerate from the bench to the bedside for potential treatments in our rare disease space. The Rare Disease Cures Accelerator will provide the infrastructure for a cooperative scientific approach to clinical trial readiness in rare diseases. We know that in rare diseases, we have many um, unmet needs. And we've identified three key components that we hope that the RDCA, the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator, will address over time. The first is a centralized and standardized infrastructure to support and accelerate rare disease characterization. The second, is a standard core set of clinical outcome assessments. So this would be measuring the impacts that matter most to patients, and, it, and hopefully these core sets of clinical outcome assessments can be applicable to more than one rare disease. Currently, there's work ongoing in this area through a different funding mechanism by the agency that, that does touch on some rare diseases, um, including pain and physical function. And finally, component is a global rare disease clinical trials network. Recently, the agency put out a request for information on what would this look like. And if you are interested in commenting on the docket, the docket closes July 31st on what we would need to know um, about how to put together a rare disease clinical trial network. But I want to focus a little bit more on the first component, the centralized and standardized infrastructure which is really what we're trying to get out of our DCA DAP. And so we know that there's a compelling need to be able to efficiently characterize natural history data. We know that we need to take that characterization and conduct it rigorously with the attention to data quality standards so that when it is reviewed in the regulatory setting, the data is clean and understandable and interpretable. We hope that a standardized rare disease uh, platform will allow for a natural history study data platform that will be able to conduct standardized natural history studies in a disease neutral framework where we can layer disease specific needs over time. So not only will this provide standardization of what's collected, but allowing any customization that may be needed. The primary goal of RDCA will be to establish a data management and data repository system that can be used to house data from existing and planned rare disease clinical studies and trials that will be contributed from different organizations. This platform will leverage existing scientific expertise in data management and rare disease knowledge with partner scientific organizations. This platform will build clinical trial readiness in the pre-competitive space to foster innovation for patients with rare disease. And that is really important that we see that this work does need to happen in the pre-competitive space with all of our stakeholders, including our industry stakeholders, and the need to be able to share data to work, to be able to cultivate and work together to help us understand nat the natural history of uh, the various rare diseases where often natural history is unknown. 
As Pam mentioned, uh, we see the RDC DAP as a neutral independent data collaboration and analytics hub that really will promote data sharing um, across various rare diseases and so hopefully will accelerate the understanding of disease progression. Again, this is a partnership between the Critical Path Institute and NORD. And the, the figure you see on your screen, and my colleague Jane Markendale, who will be speaking next, will be going in more detail about uh, this particular slide um, and how we envision uh, RDCA DAP and how it would work. So what, do, what, what will RDCA DAP do? It will promote the sharing of existing patient level data. And today we are lucky to have Dr. Robert Alexander speak of that experience of data sharing um, and what lessons learned and how it was important to be able to share data. We want to encourage the standardization of data collection and integrate patient level data from diverse data sources and hopefully be able to apply analytics to characterize disease progression and inform drug development. We really do see this initiative, um, particularly if you look on the left column of the different types of data sources being able to bridge various different data types through data sharing to our groups who may be collecting registry data, to our industry colleagues who may have clinical trial data they want to share, to clinical investigators who may have work that they also wish to share. By pulling this data together, it will only better inform what we can do and accelerate rare disease drug development. So ultimately, what are some of our long-term goals for RDCA DAP? Well, first and foremost, if you haven't heard me say in the last couple of slides, it's really to establish a decentralized and standardized infrastructure. We do hope that this will allow for more efficient and effective clinical trial protocols. We hope to be able to use CDISC formats for regulatory submissions by standardizing data collections, and if needed, explore developing new uh, data uh, speed disk standards or, or standardized data collection methods. Could the RDC DAP help us in identifying and understanding the variance in disease progression across a broad range of patients and help us be able to optimize our trial protocols that can include endpoint selection, inclusion criteria, and sample size? We hope that the analytics and simulations tool will help us also to optimize the trial protocols. And one goal that I know is often of interest to many people is that we hope to have the ability to find and match historical or contemporary control patients that can enrich our placebo arms and reduce the number of patients. And this is a lofty goal and we hope we can get there. It is something that if we work together by pulling multiple sources of data, we may be able to achieve. At this time, I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, Jean Markendale from the Critical Path Institute, tell you more about um, what RDC DAP does and what, um, what we hope to get out of it. Jean? Thanks, Michelle. And thank you to you and Pam for that great introduction as to why we're building this platform and the, and the basics behind what we're doing here. So I'm going to get a little bit more into the nuts and, nuts and bolts of the, of the IDC ADAP, ADAP program. And I'm starting with the same diagram that Michelle just, just showed you, because the questions I've got, and I've talked to probably well over 200 different groups about, about this project at this point, is it comes down to really three questions. Where does the data come from? What are we doing with the data once we have it? And how can other people access and use the data out the other end? And what the uses of that data are? So that's really what I'm going to be covering in my comments in the next 15 minutes or so. So let's start with where the data come from. So to be clear, we don't collect new data. We're not a patient registry. We're not a clinical trial. We're not a natural history study. What we do is we try and work with existing data sources, share copies of that data, and then integrate that data, standardize that data, and make it available both for ourselves and for the external community to use that data. So we're looking at existing data sources. We love clinical trial data. There's value on the baseline data, the placebo arm data, and the drug arm data. They all have value. 
the advantage of clinical trial data is we're really looking at building a database to accelerate drug development. And data from clinical trials re represents the patient population that's involved in clinical trials. Natural history data is also very valuable because it covers much broader swathes of disease from beginning to end of progression, much broader, deeper, deeper sets of data. So we love natural history data too. And of course, for many diseases, um, the only data may, that exists may be a patient into registry or it might be a clinical data set or it may be a great data source collected at some clinical center somewhere where a bunch of patients are seen. And there's huge value in that data too, as well as every other source. Each one of these sources will tell us different things about the patients, different things about the measurements, and it's all valuable. And our plan is to try and get all of those different data sources into one place so that they can be used for analysis to really move drug development forward. Two things that I'd like to, like to point out is all the data, even when we bring it into RDCA DAP, is de-identified. So we can't identify an individual. So in that sense, we're very different from a registry that might help you with recruitment for clinical trials. Our database is very much for understanding natural history, understanding progression, understanding um, how to measure changes in a patient population. And wherever possible, we try and integrate data from multiple sources, both within one disease and across diseases, to add to the amount of data that's available and really increase the power of any analysis done on the data set. So why would anyone share data with us saying, come on, it's your data, why would it be shared? What's the value of sharing it? Well, I think this is a very big issue on rare diseases, even more so than some of the common diseases we've worked out on in CPAS before, is each data set is very small. And if you want to understand the broader, diverse patient population, you need to look at data from a large number of patients. And my 15-person data set is not going to tell us a whole lot about the broader diversity of patients. But if you add my 15 patients to your 30 patients and somebody else's 100 patients, and slowly you build up to a number that really you can do detailed mathematical analysis on. You can understand that diversity of a patient population. You can look at data from those different sources in orthogonal ways to understand what's important to patients, what's been measured in trials, what sort of what a clinically meaningful effect might be. So by bringing the power of the data together, it increases the power of all the data, your data and everybody else's. So this is going to help us design clinical trials that are much more informative and much more likely to be predictive of the broader population. As we share, share data and look at it and aggregate across different sources, it'll help us design um, better studies in the future to collect better data over time. And also, the other reason to share data is none of us have all the questions and none of us have the capacity to develop all the answers. And by getting all the data out there and sharing it, to get, sharing it, we can all start answering our different questions and inform each other's analyses and really start to understand even the rarer diseases where there really aren't that many patients to look at. So there's a huge value to industry in sharing data simply because the number of patients is small and the need to understand diversity is large. So putting it all into one place gives us all an opportunity to develop better trials, understand diseases better, look for new targets, and really move drug development forward. Of course, we've heard many concerns from industry about why they might not, be, not want to share data. A lot of it comes down to what other people might do with data from an individual data set. Will other people, whether it's other companies or other regulators or somebody else come in and reanalyze the data and come to different conclusions? There are several ways we can mitigate this concern. Firstly, when we share data with, with an individual source, they tell us how widely we can share their data. You might say to, say to us, RDC ADAP can share this data with anyone, which would allow anyone to use it. You might say it can be shared with certain groups after approval through a steering committee, or the patient level data really are not comfortable with sharing this particular data set, but you can use it to build tools and share aggregate data and, and, and analytics of that data. Um, if somebody does go in and publishes a bad analysis of the data, um, this is a concern we often hear from academics because nobody else can possibly understand the data I collected. Well, we always have the opportunity in the scientific literature to write responses to paper, explain why the analysis was poorly done and why the first conclusions were correct. There's always that option. And we often hear concerns about losing competitive advantages over, over other companies. Again, this can be controlled by not sharing the data as widely. But I would argue you don't, it's not so much that you lose competitive advantage over other companies as you all gain advantage by knowing your patient population better, your endpoints and biomarkers better, and can really move that drug development process forward for everyone. And we can certainly talk, talk to individual groups about concerns they have. But in CPAS experience, 
we can mitigate the concerns of pretty much any group with sharing data. This graph shows data at CPAS over, that we've just been aggregated over the past 10 years. As you can see here, we have over 100,000 patients' worth of data in our databases. Many of these, of course, come from more common diseases like Alzheimer's disease, which Dr. Alexander is going to talk about later, and Parkinson's disease. But you can see there in red, we also have a significant amount of rare disease data. I've been very involved in our Duchenne muscular dystrophy program, for example, and we have over 5,000 patients worth of Duchenne data in our database at this point. So it's very possible to share data, even in rare diseases. That's a combination of clinical trials, natural history studies, clinical registries, patient report registries, all of which you contribute into analysis that I'll tell you a little bit about um, in, in a short while. But we, we like to show the slide just to show that companies and academics and various groups have all been able to share data with these sorts of projects before. And Dr. Alexander was going to talk about his personal experience of sharing with the Alzheimer's Consortium and the concerns they had and how they overcame them. But this is really an important part of this project and for the rare disease community to understand that data sharing is not only possible, it's been done many times before. So, Assuming you've got past that hurdle and you're ready to share data, what does this look like? The first thing that we do is we get, we're, we get in contact with the individual data custodian and talk to them about their data, and we negotiate what's called a data sharing agreement. And this is really the secret source, where we make sure that everything's legal, the patients are consented, it was an ethical study and all of, all of that good stuff. But the data custodian also tells us what we can do with the data. Can we share with everyone? Can we share with anyone approved by a steering committee? Or can we only share aggregate data or analyses and not the patient level data at all? And that is done on an individual data set level or even lower than that. Some companies have said, well, you can share our placebo and baseline data with anyone. So our drug arm data, we're not so comfortable with that being shared. Maybe we, 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 want, um, we want that to go to a steering committee. And that's a possibility. So we try and be flexible because the whole basis of this project and the value, the value of this data, data analytics platform is in the data. Once we've come to an agreement, we've signed that legal agreement and data is ready to transfer, we provide a secure link. The um, custodian needs to de-identify the data. But once it's de-identified, it's as simple as cutting and pasting a data set in whatever format um, into, um, into a secure link along with some supporting document to help us understand it. We bring it in-house, we curate the data, we standardize the data, we map it so that it's, uh, it's consistent with CBIS terminology if it needs to be used in a, a regulatory submission. And in that process, we often do have to go back to the custodian with a few questions because you are the experts on your data. Uh, and beyond that, once the data's in there, it's been standardized and integrated, we'll make it available. It, can, it will be made available per the custodian's direction. So if you've said we can share it with anyone, people can go in and start analyzing and looking at the data immediately. If it requires a steering committee, there'll be a simple web form to request access and we'll go to a steering committee and then made available. Some of the data will not be um, shared with us in a way that we can share it with other people. And that will still be in, in, um, integrated into tools and analyses that we, we're, we're doing in health, which then the tools and analyses will be made available because this is a public project. And the idea is to make everything that we can publicly available and used by the rare disease community to accelerate drug development. In the process of doing all of this, we're going to learn quite a lot about the data and we'll provide feedback to the custodians on any data gaps, or gaps in standardization or anything else that would make future data collection more useful. That's probably more value in the case of a natural history study or a registry than a clinical trial, which once it's done, you probably don't care if your data could have been better or it might be too late to do anything about it. But certainly in terms of other data collections, pointing out that there may be inconsistencies in the way a test is being run or missing data that would be incredibly valuable can really add to future data collection. So I'm going to change tax now. I've, I've told you a little bit about what sort of data and how it comes in. I've told you a little bit about what we're doing with the data. And I'm going to turn now to what the value of the data is and what we, we can do with the data out the other end if you share this data. Because I think it's easy to envisage a database that contains all this data across all these rare diseases. But what are you actually going to do with it? How is this going to accelerate drug development? We call this the rare disease cures accelerator. How are we accelerating cures? I'm going to give you a few brief examples of tools we've built at CPAS through previous projects that demonstrate the value of using these larger integrated databases. 
The first example is, real, is looking at development of a biomarker. And this is a uh, work from our Polycystic Kidney Disease Consortium, which was looking at total kidney volume initially as a prognostic biomarker for polycystic kidney disease. They integrated data, they brought the data together, they built a series of mathematical models, and went through the, um, the qualification pathways at both FDA and EMA and qualified this new biomarker as a prognostic biomarker. Since then, it's been used in a bunch of, bunch of different studies, and it's actually been accepted as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint, and a drug has been approved based on this data. We've gone from very little drug development activity in the polycystic kidney disease space to quite a lot of activity, demonstrating the value of really having the data, understanding what can be measured in a reasonable time, what can be measured in the clinical trial, and really how to develop an effective clinical trial in this space. So that's one really nice example of the sorts of tools that can be built from this data. Another example, and this is a more recent example, is Diffels and Parkinson's disease, which obviously isn't a rare disease. Again, looking at a biomarker, dopamine transport of positive patients as measured by imaging. And they built a number of models based on looking at patients who were debt positive versus patients who weren't debt positive and what would happen if they enriched a clinical trial population of, with debt positive patients um, in a trial in early stage Parkinson's disease. And they demonstrated, that at least in this particular simulation that's shown here, they could reduce the, um, the population of patients that needed to come into the trial um, by 25% without reducing the power of the trial. Again, really nice demonstration of the value of the biomarker, how the biomarker can be used to optimize clinical trial, how you could use it to reduce the sample size, which means the trial is shorter, quicker, cheaper, and you can move on to the next stage trial or um, decision making more quickly really valuable use of integrated data. The next example comes from the Duchenne um, Consortium that I, that I run, which is really trying to understand variability in a rare disease community. I think many of you on the phone, if you've worked in rare diseases, know this is a very common problem in rare diseases, where the patient population is small and extremely variable. And in, the, in this project, we've been actually looking at six different endpoints and trying to understand how variable each of these are in the populations and how we can predict which patients are going to change at what rate, at what stage of disease. So again, we can reduce the number of patients in the clinical trial and come to definitive answers more quickly. In this consortium and many of our other consortia, we then take the underlying models and build these things called clinical trial simulation tools. Where you can do exactly as the title suggests. You can simulate a clinical trial before you go out and run it. You can choose what your trial design parameters are, look at the duration, look at the assessment frequency, understand what the baseline features of your population are that would define your inclusion criteria, and plug in what you think your drug is going to do based on preclinical work or earlier trials. Um, is it going to slow disease? Is it going to increase strength? What, what, what effects you expect your drug to have? And then you can simulate your trial and look at it and say, well, and if I run the trial the way I've planned it, will I see a statistically significant difference at the end if my drug works the way I expect it will. If the answer is yes, great, go ahead and do the trial. If no, you can go back and tweak those parameters. Maybe you need to ch change your inclusion criteria. Maybe you need to re recruit a few more patients or run the trial a little longer. But then you can go into the trial with some confidence that if your drug does what you expect it to do, you will get a definitive result at the other end and know whether to move on with the drug or stop it and, and move on to a different drug that might work better. And this, again, is a nice example of the power of the data that we're developing through our DCA DAP. So all of that data we talked about, all of the potential contribution, contributed data of the different sorts comes into this platform. We standardize it. We make it available. People can look at it at a simple dashboard level to understand if there's the data they're interested in is available. We're obviously not integrating 7,000 data sets, disease data sets and multiple data sets in each disease all at once. So initially we won't have data on every disease in there, but at least you can look at the dashboard and see what data there is. We'll have a second interface, what, we, what we're calling a data interrogator and data mark generator, where you can go in, look at the data, interrogate the data and say, I'm interested in this endpoint in this patient population. What data do you have? Does it meet a normal distribution? Do basic stats on it to see if it will answer your question and then pull out that subset of data that you need for your own specific analysis. And then a third interface that we call the advanced analytic platform, where you can do the much more advanced analytics, development of the models where I've just been talking about, potentially uh, machine learning and AI exploration of the data, development of new hypotheses. 
and such like. So then you can go in and use much more advanced programs to develop much more advanced tools, still based on the same data sets. So depending on your experience, your knowledge, your questions, you'll be able to inter interface with this um, database in many different ways to, to do the analysis you want. And of course, depending on your question, you may be interested in accessing just data from one disease to look at progression of that disease, or looking at data across diseases to look at the dynamics of, of a biomarker or an endpoint or looking at changes in a symptom that affect many diseases. So there are lots of different ways you can pull the data and analyze the data in this platform. But the idea, what we want, is to develop actionable drug development solutions to really accelerate therapy developments for rare diseases. So just to summarize, this platform will provide curated and standardized rare disease data to companies, other researchers, and the community as a whole. It will allow cross-disease searches and searches within the disease, in individual diseases to really help us accelerate drug development. It will help us collect, improve data collection and data analysis over time and help us share the data we have so every study is as informed by data as is possible. And it will provide an analytics platform to help us use that data. One of my colleagues likes to refer to analysis as the process by which data is transformed into knowledge. And I think we all know that we need as much knowledge as possible based on as many patients as possible to make drug development as efficient and as effective as possible for rare diseases. So that's the goal of this platform. But everything we do is based on data. And with that, I'm going to pass it pass over to um, a friend and colleague, Dr. Alexander from Takeda, who has worked closely with, with our Alzheimer's Consortium. He and his company have shared data. And I think he can give you a personal experience of what it's like to share data through a project like this and use that data. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Dr. Robert Alexander, and thank you for being willing to talk about this important subject, subject of this webinar. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Jane. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as Jane mentored, I'm going to share our experience at Takeda sharing the Tomorrow study, which was a very large study uh, in uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, I guess you could summarize my talk uh, that first, the Critical Path is a terrific partner to work with and that made data sharing very easy. And secondly, it is possible to share your data. Uh, it just requires some persistence and an internal uh, champion. So. Uh, the Tomorrow study was a study that was conducted jointly between Takeda and Zinfandel, and I'm a full-time employee of, of Takeda. So just to give you a sense of the, the type of data set that we shared, um, uh, I'm just going to go over the study very briefly. Um, the study had two goals. One was uh, to test out a, a risk algorithm based primarily on genotype and age to see if that could produce if healthy elderly uh, subjects would convert uh, to a mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's over a five-year period. And then uh, in those uh, subjects who were thought to be at high risk for conversion to see if a low dose of uh, our drug pioglitazone could uh, delay that conversion. And uh, it was a, a single large trial. It, we actually screened 24,000 uh, uh, subjects in the U.S., the EU, and Australia, and uh, essentially uh, patients who were considered at high risk at entry were randomized to get either pioglitazone or placebo, and then there was a smaller uh, arm of low-risk subjects. You can see the numbers here, so roughly 3,000 high-risk strata, 400 in the low risk. And then all the subjects had uh, uh, detailed neuropsychological uh, assessments every six months, and if they showed evidence of decline, then there was a structured way of, uh, of determining whether they had met the criteria for uh, mild cognitive impairment. So a very rich, uh, large data set. It was a time to event study, so the goal was to get to 200 conversions. So um, the, uh, and then we just, uh, the, the primary comparison was between, you know, to determine whether the biomarker work was between this low risk placebo and high risk placebo and whether the, the drug prevented the conversion was between the two high risk strata. And you can see we started this way back in 2013 um, and uh, we did a an futility analysis in January of 2018 and unfortunately it was determined that we weren't going to meet our success criteria so the study was terminated later that year. And then, you know, after sharing the top line results, we were focused on uh, how could we uh, share the data set. 
And this just gives you a sense of we had at the time of futility, we had about 100 conversions, and you can see how they distributed. In case you're curious about the results, um, the biomarker algorithm actually did work. Uh, the all conversion rate was low, but uh, we were able to discriminate uh, between the high risk and low risk placebo group, as you can see here. But unfortunately, um, uh, whoops, uh, the drug itself uh, did not did not seem to have a significant effect. Well, uh, we we did a detailed analysis of the safety to make sure that um, we didn't, especially focusing on reverse events that were seen at full dose pioglitazone. Unfortunately, we didn't see any evidence uh, of uh, increase in uh, regardless of whether you're high risk or low risk. We did interestingly see a mortality benefit. Um, in the high-risk uh, group um, who received pioglitazone. So this is just a summary of our study. You know, biomarker algorithms seem to be effective, the drug not so much so, and uh, safety looked good. So uh, when we, uh, after expending all this time and effort, um, and obviously we were disappointed by the result, uh, we thought, well, how can we sort of maximize the scientific uh, uh, utility of the study? How can we best share it? Uh, with the scientific community, the Alzheimer's community, so uh, maybe it will help develop uh, uh, another drug. Uh, and so we sort of focused on um, uh, several paths. Our normal way of sharing data at Takeda is to use Viv, which is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, resource, but it's something that puts a lot of burden on the investigators. They have to be pretty savvy. Um, obviously, you can't aggregate across studies. There's something you can't do it easily, um, and it's 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 a much more labor-intensive way to look at the data than a uh, curated uh, 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 data set like uh, one we're talking about today. So our, the first uh, thing we did is we shared with Critical Path for Alzheimer's, but we're also going to uh, uh, use the Duke uh, SOAR repository to share the data. And just to say some of the challenges that uh, that we experience. So, what you, as a company, we're committed to data transparency, and we, as I mentioned, we see great value in curation, harmonization, aggregation. Uh, but that's not our sort of default way of doing it. So this was an exception. And I think uh, you know one challenge, speaking from the industry perspective, is that once the study is over. You know, I think most of you know resources are moved on to new projects, and um, data sharing is really no one's job. So if there's nobody's job, often nobody does it. So uh, the key is really to have someone internal who is dedicated to it to keep the process moving and overcome roadblocks. It has to be roadblocks because people, you know, it's new and people have reservations, similar to what Jane has said. But, you know, they're, they're, they're fairly easily overcome. And I would admit that the tomorrow study in some ways represents an easier case because first it was negative and the drug itself was off patent. Um, but still there were concerns were raised, like could the safety data be misinterpreted? Would that have some impact? And we mitigated that uh, by doing a very thorough safety review before we share the data. And of course, there's always, you know, people are wondering, is the company going to lose out on some important IP? Again, we had this really have a detailed discussion with uh, the senior management and lawyers about that and to convince them that there really was pretty low risk here. Um, just this, uh, I, I meant to our input, um, but some of the things that the lawyers, our lawyers focused on, and I think they actually have been uh, – Adapted in the in the later uh, data contribution agreements of, of CPATH is that you know they they want to know that uh, sometimes uh, the original language said that we had to attest that there was they had specifically consented to this kind of sharing, which of course wasn't anticipated when the study was started. Um, and you know they want more clarity around the, the, the identification of the data and privacy protections. So I mean I think those those things again are things that the lawyers often are concerned about, but that are certainly uh, addressable. So um, I think you know it, uh, it's it's important to understand why is it difficult for companies to share data. And I think as I mentioned, one of the, the, the the major reason is that someone has to um, own it and take accountability for it because I think 
um, you know, we want to work on things that we think are ultimately going to uh, become drugs. And once something that it's apparent that they're, it's not, you know, then people resources move up. But I think uh, we can help the prospects of future drugs by sharing the data from some of these studies where the drug uh, was not effective. One thing I want to mention is that this ability to sort of set the level of data sharing was very uh, useful in getting internal approval to share the tomorrow study data. So uh, that you know you can you can set at different levels how broadly uh, it can be shared, and I think that that goes a long way to to reassure people that have uh, concerns. Um, uh, you know, we did the anonymization for this study internally, uh, but you know I think it would be helpful if it, it and certainly could facilitate, especially for smaller companies that don't have resources, if there was a way to do that through a third party. And of course, you know, especially in the rare disease space, uh, but true for all studies, you know, privacy is a, is a major uh, uh, concern uh, by everyone involved. And, you know, that really requires careful attention in, when constructing the data sharing agreement. So, um, as always, I want to acknowledge uh, all our many study participants and investigators who contributed to the tomorrow study, and uh, just want to encourage uh, everyone who has data to share uh, uh, to do so. I think the, the benefit to the field, whether it's Alzheimer's or rare disease, um, is going to be uh, terrific. And uh, I'll stop my remarks there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really a special thank you to all of our speakers who we know are presenting from the safety of their homes. So thank you for taking the time to share this exciting program with our community. Um, we will wrap up with a few questions. If you do have some, you can certainly uh, enter your questions in the chat function here. We've received quite a few questions during the presentation. So we're going to get through as many as we can. Um, but we will Rest assured, any of the questions that we aren't able to address live here today, um, we will share those all with our presenters. Uh, we'll share responses publicly with you in the coming weeks as well, so you can see what other questions that folks had. Um, looking at the questions that we have so far, Michelle, I'm going to start with a question for you. Um, we had a participant wondering if you could please clarify the regulatory use cases for data contributions anticipated timeline for completion of projects, and also any opportunities for contributors to engage with RDCA DAP and FDA on these projects? Well, thanks for that. I, I may have to ask you to repeat a Michelle, can you hear us? I think we may have lost you. Okay, I'm going to tra transition and um, ask maybe this question to Jane while we see if we can get Michelle's audio back up. Um, Jane, can only those that contribute data access data? And then how does one know that the data included is comprehensive? Yeah, those are both really good questions. Absolutely no to the first question. Um, anyone can access data on the platform as permitted by the, uh, the original data custodians. So we're hoping most data will be shared with the, consortium, uh, with the platform either for use by anyone or for use by anyone after approval by a steering committee that would review whether it's a valid scientific question, in which case anybody would be able to access the platform and use the data, at least the degree permitted by the original owners of the data. With respect to the comprehensiveness of the data, of course, we can't guarantee that, particularly in the early days when we have limited amounts of, amounts of data. And that's really the goal of the data interrogator um, view, view that I talked about, where you'll be able to go in and interrogate the data and see how much data there is available that would answer your question. And of course, you can't go in knowing absolutely nothing about a disease area and know how comprehensive that is. You, you need to use some background. Um, knowledge and information 
to to be able to look at the data, but at least there and there on the platform you can do some basic statistical analyses to see if the data follows a normal curve. If it should be um, should following a normal curve, is there equal are there equal numbers of patients who are male and female? If, if um, they should there should be and all of those sort of questions. So no, the data won't necessarily be comprehensive, but we're offering you the tools to figure out if it is or not. And we're actually starting looking looking for data um, in specific disease areas, so we can start by trying to get more than one data set in a disease area to make the data more useful as we bring it in. Okay, great. Thank you. Michelle, are you have you joined us again? Perhaps then another question for Bob or maybe Jane. Um, question is, what should industry tell patients about how the data will be used? If it keeps the data anonymous and if they'll be able to see data and understand the timeline, patients sometimes get frustrated when they share their information but then don't see follow-up. So I think that's kind of the basis of this question. Yeah, I can take that to start with, and I'm sure Dr. Alexander will add to it. So it so the goal is, of course, to make the, make the data available, but it's de-identified data. So I can't, can't come back to you and say, hey, Alexa, your data was used for this because I don't know where you are in my data set or whether I'm using your data or not. But what we will be doing is providing both through Nord and through other channels feedback as to what data we have in the database, how it's been used, Not maybe not the specifics of what an individual company is doing, but the... Angelman syndrome data was used by five company members and in the development of six trials, and there'll be feedback at that level, and through several different forms of media, through meetings, through webinars, through the Nord newsletter, and other communications. So if, if you've contributed data to the platform, we will provide feedback back out to at least the custodian of the data, and it will be up to them to then feed back to the individual patients. And Dr. Alexander, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you know that you're going to be sharing the data with a specific, uh, you know, repository as, before the study starts, it would be great you can include that language in informed consent. Almost we, often we don't know. So it would, be, it would be helpful to craft some kind of language that would allow that flexibility at a future point you could share it. And actually I think that might uh, help with enrollment in the sense that patients will realize that they're um, really contributing uh, to the overall science for their disease, not just for a specific drug. Great. Thank you. Very helpful, both of you. Um, Michelle, I'll transition back to that first question that we had on the regulatory use cases for data contributions, uh, any anticipated timelines for the completion of projects, and then opportunities for the contributors to engage with FDA on the projects. Yes, thank you, Alexa, and my apologies to everyone. Um, as we are using more technology, uh, a hiccup is bound to happen. So I think in terms of the collaborations uh, with our UCA and the agency, um, as I was saying, the slide you have has an opportunity to be able to um, discuss contributing and how that um, will happen and things like that. Um, and oftentimes, as being a part of this, the agency is aware of what is going on. Um, but uh, I would encourage, if you are interested in contributing and participating, to start first with that uh, email and that website that's on the slide in front of you. Um, asking about um, the timeline, so that's a really great question. I think as we are we're, uh, we are new into this, we just launched this last September, um, and so I think we're trying to learn from some demonstration projects that we have going on right now what that time frame will look like. And so um, I think we are still learning on that and we'll be able to really address that in the near future. Um, we will be having a, uh, another public meeting sometime in October um, and, and hopefully then we'll be able to have learned more from the last year and maybe be able to better answer that question. Um, obviously in the rate of these drug development space, we want to accelerate um, but it doesn't mean we should go so fast that we'll make mistakes. And so I think we need to make sure we identify the appropriate time frame that will be needed to be able to get the answers um, that will have a better informed drug development opportunity. Um, and the last part was about regulatory examples and in cases. Um, I think Jane did a good job of, explaining, of showing some examples from prior work of the Critical Path Institute um, where data sharing um, 
was able to make a regulatory decision, for example, in the biomarker space, um, and and how uh, there's been some modeling work in some other diseases that really, um, from data sharing, that, that have been trying to inform and enhance trial design. Um, I think as we move forward with this initiative, we'll have more examples to share. Um, but I think that is a great goal to have be able to share that and something that we want to make sure that we do going forward. So I turn it back to you, Alexa. Thank you. Thanks for your response. We do have another question. Actually, we have several more. Um, maybe this one for Pam. Uh, people are wondering if you have a direct EMR transfer or will patients be able to enter their data directly into the database? So as I think the slide, there are a couple of images that were in the slide deck that Michelle and Jane um, referred to that there are, that there is the opportunity to pull in data from different sources uh, like EHR data. For patients specifically entering data directly into um, the RDC ADAP, it's not a registry, so the ideal situation is for um, a patient to participate and contribute to a registry. Um, whether it's um, studies on platforms like NORS or others. And from that, the data will be de-identified and sent to the RDC ADAP. Great, thank you. And I know we're running tight on time. Maybe one more question. Um, how do you ensure that one individual isn't overrepresented in the combined data set if they're participants in multiple data sources? So if they participate in a clinical trial and a registry. Um, maybe to Jane. Sure. And this is really is an issue in rare diseases where there are limited numbers of patients. And unfortunately, because the data that we get is de-identified, we can't guarantee that a single patient isn't in the database as part of multiple studies as things are now. Um, obviously, what would be ideal is if uh, we all used a global unique identifier in all the studies out there so that I don't, didn't need to know that um, this is Alexa and three studies, but it is patient 27345 in each of those studies, and we could inter um, integrate those records together as all being part of the same record. As things stand now, we can't do that. Uh, we may end up with the same patient overrepresented, and in fact, in some of the databases I run, I know the same patients in multiple studies. I just don't know who they are. We do, as we build our drug development tools, do analysis to see if there are any real outliers or anything that doesn't represent the whole population, and hope we can identify things there, that way. But unfortunately, until we all start using the same billing system, this is going to continue to be a problem. Okay, thank you. I am cognizant of time, and I know we didn't answer everyone's questions, but we do want to hear from you. Um, so if you'd like to contribute data to the RDC ADAP, please visit the cpath.org programs RDC ADAP or email RDC ADAP at cpath.org, as you'll see here. And as Michelle mentioned, we do have an upcoming virtual workshop, so you might want to save the date for this. It's October 19th. Uh, registration is now open and we'll hold the annual RDC ADAP workshop on this date. Uh, a formal announcement on whether the meeting, um, on details of the meeting and how to join um, will be here, and as you can see, the registration link is provided. Finally, I just want to bring things to a close by thanking all of our speakers, um, Pam, Michelle, Jane, Dr. Alexander. Thank you for being with us today and for sharing the details of this incredibly exciting and important collaborative project. Thank you for joining us.